Well, I want to talk about the ultra processed foods because when we're talking about sugar, um, we're not talking about the apple. We're not talking about the berries. We're not talking about the sweet potato. We're talking about the bag of potato chips or the right. orange juice or the fruit boxes, the sodas, the alcohol, all of those things. So what is it, what has happened to our food supply where it's literally an addiction? It goes along with social media addiction and gambling addiction and alcoholism, but it's, you're not going to sit down and eat five potatoes, but you are going to sit down and eat a bag of potato chips. Yes. So, so oil and salt, when they, you add it to carbs really uh, stimulates the appetite and, um, and at the same time, the salt helps convert the carbs into sugar. And then once you've been eating a lot of sugar, you become very hungry. And so having a lot of fat, fatty food around actually gives you the calories that cause the, the rapid weight gain. So the, the, the sugar is really the trigger to make you hungry. Uh, and then it's actually the high fat foods then that drive the weight gain. And if you are on a low carb diet, you don't have the sugar to that stimulates the appetite. So you can be on a high fat diet without gaining weight because it's like putting a lot of wood on a fire without a fire. But, um, but basically, yeah. So when you eat potato chips, it's different from like eating a plain potato because the salt helps convert that potato into sugar in your body. Right. Go ahead, Rob. So the, the, the question that your audience wants to understand and wants to know is what foods are addictive? Okay. And there's right. a, something called the Yale food addiction scale. And obviously, you know, sugar's at the top and fat and salt are a little bit lower, not, you know, not gone, but a little bit lower. And then protein is kind of at the bottom. And that's actually how price elasticity works too. If you look at the pro most price elastic foods, which means that they're not addictive, it's like eggs. And if you look at the most price inelastic foods, which means you'll pay any amount to get your fix, it's, you know, fast food, soft drinks and juice. And so, you know, there are a lot of people who say, well, food can't be addictive. It's necessary for survival, blah, blah, blah. All right. Well, here is this volume right here called food and addiction and you can see it's pretty darn thick okay <laughs> it's got 60 chapters in it okay there is one chapter that says that food is not addictive you know from the naysayers over in europe but other than that basically they're all saying the same thing so the question is all right which foods are addictive and the answer is sugar sugar is addictive fructose actually stimulates the nucleus accumbens the reward center, the same place that cocaine, heroin, and nicotine stimulate. It also happens to be where shopping, gambling, internet gaming, social media, and pornography stimulate. There's one reward system, but there are multiple pathways into it. And sugar happens to be one of them. And sugar stimulates the reward system. Fat and salt don't. But fat and salt increase the salience of sugar, possibly for the reasons that Rick just told you that, for instance, a sodium load actually changes the vasopressin 1B receptor, which increases the polyol pathway to make fructose. So it's very possible that uh, salt and fat are gateways for sugar to be more addictive, but it's actually the fructose molecule itself that is the addictive molecule. And, and so they, they take these foods and they'll inject them with salt and sugar and uh, other things, MSG and all these kinds of things that are not that healthy. And, uh, and then they try to make the food taste really good. And so this is really the, com the, the, uh, the strategy of a lot of, of, of groups that are trying to sell food. They, they, make, they add all these things that are actually very bad for us but that they that stimulate addiction and, and craving. So kettle corn, for example, <laughs> they take popcorn, which, you know, so popcorn is relatively benign by itself. But then when you add the sugar and the salt and the fat and you get this thing called kettle corn or whatever, then you're really in trouble because people just inhale it, you know. <laughs> 
Right. And I want, I want to challenge anyone out there to eat 10 cups of plain popcorn with no butter or salt or anything on it. You just won't do it. And I've got a daughter who's 18. She's an athlete and she's trying to put on some weight. If I give her plain rice with her bison burger, she has a hard time finishing it. So I put on the butter and I put on the salt because her goal is to actually put some weight on. And then she's able to get it down because her brain says, okay, I like this. I want some more. And as we're talking about food and addiction, I think we should start with the definition of food, right? Well, indeed, indeed. But before we do, and I, I, I want to go there. Let me just tell you a little anecdote that I think, you know, solidifies the question because you brought up this issue of rice. Okay. So once upon a time, I was a fellow at University of California, San Francisco in 1983. And then I moved away and then I moved back to, uh, you know, become professor in 2001. So there was an 18 year time difference between my first sojourn and my second. And when I first went to UCSF, in 1983, I would go to Chinese restaurants and they would always have both white rice and brown rice. Okay. And that made sense. And, you know, brown rice was a big, becoming a big deal at the time. And then I moved to New York city and they had white rice and brown rice also, just like, uh, San Francisco did. And then 18 years later, I moved back to San Francisco and they only had white rice. Now, if brown rice is supposed to be so good for you and San Francisco is such a health conscious city, how come they had it back in 1983, but they don't have it now? What happened in the interim? So that's a quiz. And the answer is in San Francisco, they charge for the rice. In New York, they don't. Rice is part of the meal. And so in New York, they didn't care whether they ate white or brown. It made no difference to them. But in San Francisco, they realized, these Chinese restaurants realized that when they served brown rice, people ate half a bowl. And when they served white rice, they ate two bowls. And if you're charging for the rice, which would you rather they purchase? And so brown rice disappeared because white rice goes down a whole lot better. And the reason, of course, is because the fiber in the brown rice actually moves the food through the intestine. So you get the satiety signal sooner, which of course is why ultra processed food is also fiberless food. Right. So not only the addition of sugar, but the removal of fiber is sort of what's happened to our, um, our food supply over the last 50 years.